This is uh, an interview with uh, Clarence Burbaum for the Veterans History Project, uh, September 5th, 2007, um, uh, conducted by Jesse Philippi uh, in studio, studio X Campbell Hall at WILL TV, uh, Urbana, Illinois. Um, okay. First question. Uh, were you were you aware of the war that was uh, already going on overseas before Pearl Harbor? Oh attacked? yes, very much so. From from the from uh, well, when it first uh, Hitler first started uh, into Europe, yeah. Okay. We, we we had a lot of information from that, yeah. Okay. And how like how was that? Was it usually the news or? Oh, it was, it was radio news. Of course, radio. didn't have any television that right. day. That the radio uh, covered things quite well. Yeah, mm -hmm. and we we heard the problems they had over there. And of course, I think our one of our, the presidents said, uh, "We don't want to get mixed up over there. We want to let the, <laughs> leave it to them." You know, right? Until of course, until Pearl Harbor. Okay. Yeah, I very much remember Pearl Harbor. <laughs> Okay. Um, do you remember uh, what you were doing when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Well, I was uh, on the farm. Uh, I had uh, I had I gotten out of high school, and uh, I was uh, I worked for Dad for one year, a summer, and then I got a chance to work on in radio at Robeson's. And I worked for a man there for two years, repairing radios. And uh, then I was called into the service and drafted okay. in February of '42. Okay. Um, what do you remember? What was the general feeling of like among you know the people you knew, the town, uh, on? in terms of what was the general feeling of whether or not America should even get involved in uh, Well, war. just just like there are people today that are saying we should get out of Iraq, mm -hmm. there were people who were saying, no, we shouldn't be there, and, uh, you know, before Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. and then, then, of course, when Pearl Harbor was hit, a lot of, a lot of ideas changed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, yeah. Then most of the country got behind the the, the effort. Okay. Um, when uh, when did you go into the service? Uh, uh, February the eleventh, nineteen forty-two. Okay. I was drafted in the fall, and uh, I was working for. Uh, Kenneth Lappin and Robeson's, and uh, my dad had a man working for him, and he was drafted, and so my dad needed some help for the fall work, and mm -hmm. so he went to the draft board and uh, got me off until January first, okay. and of course then they turned me, they turned him down then, so I got, I was called on February eleventh. Okay. Um. Okay. And so, okay, so how old were you at the time? I was 22. 22. Um, and you were drafted into the infantry, yeah. the uh, 100th Infantry? And Well, I, that was a long time later. Oh, okay. <laughs> when I was first drafted, I went to Camp Grant for and uh, to be inducted. And then they shipped me along with a whole bunch of other people, of the, you know, whole, a group of us, went down to Fort Knox to the fourth, ar or no, to a, the armored basic training, uh, it, it, the basic training for armored force. Mm -hmm. and, was. and we had two months there, and then they shipped us to uh, Pine Camp, New York, to the fourth armored division. Mm -hmm. And I was in a tank. <laughs> and uh, for, well, all that year, then I got a chance that fall 
to go to a radio school in Fort Knox. And I had three and a half months there. And uh, then they, by that time, the 4th Armored was in the desert in California. Mm. And uh, was, I went, uh, so then we got off of a nice train into a very bad desert. <laughs> it was a different life. So how uh, how was it? Well, it was in we, it was in January. It was from January through April. Okay. And uh, in January it wasn't too bad. It was you know seventy or eighty in the desert, but it get cold as the dickens at night. Mm. And of course the the uh, the snakes and the whole thing, you know. Right. But uh, then we would go out in uh, in, in the tanks and. Uh, I said in my documentary that we went up and down those those hills in the desert there in California an awful lot, and uh, so that yeah we were I was in there until I think it's about March. I got a chance to go to the division signal company because I was in had been in radio and I said I want to get some, something about radio, and uh, so I was in in the signal company okay. then and then we we moved the di the whole division moved to Camp Bowie Texas and we were there a couple of months and uh, I had I had heard that the Air Force Army Air Force at that time was l looking for uh, air airmen pilots co-pilots and uh, navigators so forth and so I luckily I applied and luckily got to the Air Force cadets in Mount Pleasant, Iowa, and had five months of college. And that's where they every week they would bring in another uh, another class, you know. And uh, we graduated on a Friday, and that was in the spring. <laughs> And on on Saturday, the company commander, I guess they'd call him the squadron commander there, called us all together and said, guess what? We're closing the school, and you're either going back to your outfit or you're going to the infantry. <laughs> that's, that's how I ended up in the 100th Infantry Division okay. before we went overseas. Hmm. So you said you were working for, uh, like, a radio uh, repair. Oh, you were doing radio repair for. Yeah, the and Army. this is uh, a man uh, had a, a little shop in Robeson's at that time. It was a Robeson's department store, and he was okay. in the basement. And I went down, asked him. I said, "I, all I know is farming, and I'd like to know some more about radio." And so, Slim looked and says, well, I can't afford to hire you. I said, I'll work for nothing. So I did that. I worked for a week for nothing. And finally, then he said, well, you can't afford to come in here for nothing. So he gave me $5 a week. <laughs> and that was my wow. pay for about a year. And then he raised it to seven fifty. And then finally, before I retire, before I quit there, I was making $10 a week. <laughs> wow! And so you were working there while you were in the army? Or, no, no. This, this I was. Before? I was. Uh, this is before the oh, okay. army. I, I had gotten out of school. I graduated in 1938 okay. from Champaign High, and uh, so I uh, decided I wanted to do something else. Mm -hmm. And I and Slim get, offered me the job, and so I worked. I did radio repair for two years and. Learned a lot about the basics of radio, okay. and so, and it was it was it was an. I'm glad I did because, as I've said to my wife and some other people, probably that saved my life. Really, because uh, by n just talking about radio, I was able to get into the radio repair overseas. Oh, okay, and. I could tell some stories about that too, but I, <laughs> that's, that's another story. But okay. I was able to leave my, 
my battalion and go to the regimental uh, area. They were collecting all the radio repairmen and putting them in one unit in the in the regimental headquarters. And we that's where we did radio repair. We were anywhere from a mile to two or three miles behind the lines. Okay. And usually with the big big guns, the hundred and fives, <laughs> they were shooting all the time. <laughs> okay. So that that's how I got through there. And then after the war we occupied from May until uh January second when I got on the boat to come home. Okay. But uh, yeah, that was kind of that's a very quick <laughs> story of my army career. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Um, let's see. So, uh, what ex were the? I, you've probably said this mm -hmm. um, somewhat, um, but uh, what were the? Like dates that you served from um, from when you started and ended in the army. Uh, well, when I started in the army. Yeah. Well, of course that was that is when you first get in the army. The first thing you find out is do what you're told. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when you see an officer salute, <laughs> those are the things you learn real quick. And so I was very careful. Whatever they said to do, I did. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, uh, as I say, went to to Fort Knox, and we had our two months of basic training. Mm -hmm. And by the way, my first couple of months, I was paid a, an, an, an entire sum of $21 a month, minus my laundry and minus... My my uh, insurance, which we got about seventeen dollars a month, <laughs> and then they then they raised it up, and we got fifty dollars a month. That was that was something. <laughs> That's and then I made fifty dollars a month all the time until I went overseas, and I got overseas pay. It was seventy eight dollars. I got to be a first class, a PFC, <laughs> and that's as far as I ever got. Um, when when was it again that you um, were that you were like released from the army when you um, like the end of the war and that oh at the end of the war yeah you know like when you got home and well everything. that was yeah I, when I got off I got home uh, I helped my dad mm -hmm. uh, and my brother was farming at that by that time and I helped them. And then I, I repaired radios, and I uh, wired houses and so forth. In 1946, okay. I, I wired 46. houses, and um, yeah, I, that just picked up. My, I just said I'll have to get some time off. Okay. And then I, in January of 47, I went to American Television in Chicago, a technical school. Mm -hmm. I was there until through through April of 48. And at that time, all engineers for in a broadcast service had to have a first class ticket. And so I, I, I got my, I got, you know, I, I got my first class ticket and, and when I was up in Chicago in the school. And I came down and uh, applied for a job at a station called WKID. It was in Urbana off of Philo Road. And I was there for t two years. The first uh, year and a half, I was an engineer. And then there was some engineer quit and a few other people. And so I got to be chief engineer. I really was not too well <laughs> acquainted with it all. But I mm -hmm. was a chief engineer for six months. And I went to WILL and I had a, ch a chance to uh, get in there. With the and the recording service. Okay. Then I went to television and came back as assistant chief engineer, or I was assistant chief in over there. Okay. And I was there for twenty nine years. It was 
a good experience. I certainly didn't care for the army, and my I'm, I said I took a lot of movies when I was in the service. My wife says, "How did you ever get by with a thing like that?" I took pictures of of us marching and so forth, and you know, mm -hmm. but I made a documentary, um, a documentary of uh, of my army career, and uh, my. My sister-in-law saw it, and she, afterwards she was at our house. She said, why was it so depressing? I said, because that's what it was. I was depressed for four years. But, it, yeah, it, it kind of gave a history of my Army career. Okay. Um, where, where did you serve? How's that? Where did you serve again? Oh, I served in the ATO, in, in, in European theater. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in, uh, when we were... We, we hit the uh, the battle lines in the Vosges Mountains. That was in the okay. late fall. Well, I, we got over there in November, and we hit the line around after that. And uh, a, a sidelight to this story, or this my army career, uh, as I from what I heard. That the Vosges Mountains had never been conquered in all of military history, and we were the first ones that went through, and and uh, we uh, and we I will say the the division. I certainly was behind the lines, <laughs> you know, on some of that, and they they uh, captured the citadel at Biche, France, mm -hmm. and. Uh, so that's the, our moniker on the uh, 100th Division. We call it the Loyal Sons of Beesh. Okay. <laughs> and we always, we've always <laughs> said, we always enjoy just saying that. <laughs> yeah, so then we went to, we went, they finally broke through the, the uh, Maginot Line, which, oh, tremendous fortifications, even yet. Hmm. And uh, then we went into Germany, Went through um, Mannheim, and, uh, and then uh, then we're in, we were we went to Heilbronn, and there, then they made another stand there and killed a lot of the fellas. And finally, that we the division um, conquered or you know, they, they they got Heilbronn, and we were, then we were circling Stuttgart, Stuttgart when the war ended. We were we were going we were around about halfway, and our division was when okay. uh, when the war ended in May. What was it, the eighth or ninth, something like that? Yeah. Maybe the tenth. I I still can't yeah. remember for sure. It's around that. Yeah. Um, then we we were uh, we were in occupation from there on. We were in a little town called Leonberg, and then we moved into Stuttgart and Bad Konstadt, which is a suburb of Stuttgart, Stuttgart. Mm -hmm. and uh, then we were we were very fortunate then. Of course, it was still the war was on over in Europe, over in, over in uh, Asia, mm -hmm. and uh, we were getting ready. They were still training us to go over over there, mm -hmm. and then the Japan surrendered. So then I got a couple of very good leaves, one to the Riviera which I never could have afforded. <laughs> it's beautiful. I spent a week there, and I went and spent a, spent a week in London. So uh, we were very lucky. Once, once the wars ended, we were, they were, the, the, the services were very congenial with us. <laughs> so I did That's get good. to see a lot of area over there at that time. Did you just I'm just curious did did mm -hmm. uh were you involved in any of uh, like uh freeing any concentration camps or any of that uh, after the war when uh, we were in the first part of the occupation mm -hmm. I had a very good friend um Eli as he was no anyhow. Uh, he was he was Jewish, and uh, we we went around and we saw some of the 
concentration camps from the outside. Mm -hmm. How must have been bad, you know. And uh, I was in, as I say, in, in Bad Cannstatt for a while. Then I was transferred to Kerchheim Untertek, which is a, a town about halfway between Stuttgart and, uh, let's see, we, we was around Ulm. And then uh, it was on, we went to, I can't say the name now. <laughs> oh, I, I have to stop and think. <laughs> uh. um, what is it? Uh, Stuttgart, Ulm, and Munich. Munich. Oh, okay. <laughs> and one more, one Sunday, and this was after the after the war had ended, and uh, I decided I'm going to get out of here today. So I put a K ration in my pocket, and went out on the autobahn and started thumbing away on my ride and. An officer and uh, two soldiers uh, were in the in in the uh, in the jeep, and they saw. Where are you going, soldier? I says, oh, I'm going to going down out here a ways. And they says, we're, Well, we're going we're going to Munich, so but we'll stop in at uh, at Dachau. And uh, that was a real experience. It was only a short time after it had been cleaned up. I mean. Weeks, mm -hmm. and I got to see the crematories, and where their people were hung, and I got pictures of all this, and that was that was revealing. Mm -hmm. Yes, I understand from my brother-in-law who has been over there recently to see it's left about the same. It has never been changed, but yeah, mm -hmm. it, it was that was quite depressing, and that was quite a Sunday outing. <laughs> Yeah. And then I did get to uh, to Munich, and I saw the Bergerbachheiler and that sort of thing. And then I got home. And that was a, quite a Sunday <laughs> out. <laughs> yes, that's the only thing that I can really say that I saw pretty much firsthand. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. Okay. Uh. Tell me about uh, like the chaos of, of the war. Um, kind of, how did that affect you? Uh, like... Well, um, I had some experiences. We had some, uh, you know, had had some rough times, mm -hmm. and uh, I came home and I didn't want to talk about it for a long time. Mm -hmm. After even after I got married. Uh, the wife said at times that I would roll around in bed and have dreams. It, mm -hmm. Yeah, it yeah. would. It did affect. Yeah. It affect. It didn't affect me nearly as much as uh, a lot of the fellows that had mm -hmm. it much worse than I had. Yeah. But yes, it it is. It is a traumatic a traumatic experience. Okay. Were were there times in the war? Uh, where, like, I don't know, there was so much confusion going on, or, like, was, where, did you, okay, did you know where you were most of the time, like, where the enemy um, was, where your objective was, and truly, things like that? Truly, I didn't know where I was. I, I mean, we we get in the truck, and the little trailer that we'd fix up, and we'd move to another place, and I, I knew this, uh, Pedit Redershing, Gross Redershing, <laughs> in mm -hmm. those those little towns, right. I wouldn't know where they were today. But my, as I say, my brother-in-law and his wife went over and looked at, uh, found those places, and he told me the stories more of, of where you know what they are today. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's it's all together different now than it was then. Yeah. So. Um. You said that uh, you ha you have stories about your experiences with uh, you know uh, doing radio repair for the yeah uh, that is uh, another sidelight of it. 
we we did get uh, radios you know from the front lines and mm -hmm. it was most of it, it was just a wet messy year you know it's so just terrible the snow and wet and all that and of course the guys uh, would you'd have these radios and they'd get them all wet and so we'd have a lot of work to clean them out and, mm -hmm. and dry them out and uh, of course there's some of them that something was blowing out and we had to do some repairing of them and yeah we we're always getting those things in and our communication, the little hand radios they had in those days, people today wouldn't even recognize them. <laughs> and they weren't much good. They'd go maybe a mile, if you're lucky, you know. Okay. And the ones that, uh, the radios that would go longer, they, they were a big pack. There's a big pack with a battery, I would say, would be, oh, probably eight or ten pounds just for the battery. Mm -hmm. That was went, went with this radio, and of course, an officer would try to have a radio man with them when they could mm -hmm. to to communicate with others. But a lot of it was in in my opinion, for what I get from some of the fellas, it was a, a lot of uh, confusion and maybe even chaos at times. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we we got a lot of it, a lot of radios. Uh, a repair to repair like that. Yeah. Okay. And and so you said that you were uh, usually like further back with the radio. Yeah, we uh, we usually were about a mile behind the lines, okay. maybe two miles. Yeah. We you know after all it was uh, there was there was definitely uh, there were definitely lines at that time. You, mm -hmm. know, you knew where the Germans were. Right. You knew where the Americans were, and. Uh, yeah, once in a while we'd have somebody, a German, kind of wander up in our area, and he'd find out that he was in the wrong, wrong area, and scramble, you know. Mm -hmm. And our guys would, uh, well, one of our linemen, and I saw we were talking about this years later. I'm in up in Michigan, and he said that they they were doing a lot of wiring. They 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 ran a lot of wire in those days. It was, mm -hmm. you know, that's their communication, and. Uh, he said they were told to go to one house and put up a telephone. It was at night, and it was dark, and they had to feel their way practically get through. In the next house, they didn't know it, but we're all Germans. <laughs> <laughs> so it was that close in the house, you know, when they were in these small towns. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, he he had some funny stories about that, <laughs> about the, the the things they would do, and uh, that they see somebody and they you know you just you just fall down and be quiet. Wow. Yeah, sort of thing. Yeah. yeah there's those huh. those stories. Uh, you know, you, you, it, it's interesting to right. to hear some of them. I didn't get into that. I I was usually uh, just far enough back that mm -hmm. I, I, it, well, I was I was lucky on that part. Right. And that was just when they were uh, running communication lines. Yes. Yeah. When they they try so. to run communication lines. Hmm. And of course, when the battle would move, then the then the guys would go out and they take the jeep and so forth, or take they take a, a little a, a reel or something and try to reel up all the wire they could reel, you mm -hmm. know, so they could use it the next time, because it was mainly wi wire communication. Radio was just not not that uh, reliable. Mm -hmm. In certain cases, it was, and of course, back farther. Where they had the more uh, powerful radios, they mm -hmm. that was much more uh, uh, reliable mm -hmm. than, than than our us than we had on the front lines. Okay. So, okay, so that was Morse code, or those Morse Morse code, or other kind of. We code, learned probably. Morse code, but they weren't using much Morse code. Then it was just voice. Oh, it was voice Mostly over wire. Voice, okay, yeah. I see. Yeah, we I and when I was in school and in in. in uh, Fort Knox. Mm -hmm. We 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 had to go through, uh, m learn Morse code. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. It, so, but yeah, there there were certain places. I think the Navy and different places they used Morse code in mm -hmm. a in a way in way different ways. And of course, it was all coded, and people wouldn't wouldn't catch what it was anyhow. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, during the war, uh, what what did you believe, or did you have any beliefs about uh, what was at stake in the war? Um, or specific, you know. Specifically. Well, the. Um, I think my feeling was just about what all the the soldiers were. Mm -hmm. Let's get this thing over with and go home. Yeah. But uh, it, we we knew, and I didn't know. Actually, I'll put it this way: I didn't know how bad the situation was in Germany mm -hmm. with the Jewish population until after the war when I went through Dachau. Mm -hmm. And the stories that some of those people, that those people told, uh, they, they had, uh, uh, there was one uh, fellow that could speak just fairly good English and he told some stories that, well, I wouldn't, would hate to repeat. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know. Yeah. So we didn't realize how bad it was. Mm -hmm. I do remember one point, one place, one little town in uh, in France when we were in that winter we were there and uh, when one of my the non comms came to me and said, "Beer bomb, you want to see a uh, what what the Germans do have done to some of the people?" And I thought about it about it a little bit and I said no because it was it was yeah. in a building there and they he had seen it and he showed what what had you know mm -hmm. what some of the people went through mm -hmm. and uh, it was bad enough <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, so you just wanted to mainly get out of there you, uh, a lot of it I just wanted to forget yeah, and I mean, do you have any strong beliefs about what you were fighting for, or like what? Yeah, yeah. we were yeah. fighting to keep Hitler from yeah. going any farther. Okay, because yeah. of course he had the alliance with Italy and, and Japan, and why did we? Why was Japan? Why did Japan strike Pearl Harbor? And yeah. there was an alliance there. They wanted to. Well, they all wanted to take over this the United States, and they wanted to take a piece of it. And they they were Hitler was going to take, he was the way he'd taken France, mm -hmm. and he wanted to take England. And we mm -hmm. know how bad uh, that was, and how how the the English were treated before we got into it. Yeah. And so yes, it was. It was. It was. Uh, we. We felt that it was worthwhile to do what we need, what we needed to do. Mm -hmm. okay. But okay, and did did that view of the war uh, change at all? At all, though, did that change at all when you got overseas and started fighting, or any time? The There's war? not much it, that we didn't. I don't think any of us thought that way. Okay, it was. We were in the service. We had a job to do, and we mm -hmm. did it. And, okay. You know. And so you just realized more once you yeah. finally got to the, yeah. the concentration camps. Yeah. And, oh yeah, I was just say yeah. the concentration camp. But some of that we didn't we didn't realize that till after the when we were in occupation mm -hmm. we saw those things. Yeah. And I only saw Dachau. I understand the other ones were, the other concentration camps were, just as bad or worse. Yeah. Um, you've kind of already answered this, but mm -hmm. um, how did you feel about uh, the the specific like the specific enemies that you were fighting that, that at certain times? Uh, I don't know if you were ever fighting the Italians, but or, no, uh, I I didn't get into that. Okay. They, I know some friend, people that did. 
they started in Africa and they came up through Sicily and mm -hmm. Italy and all that and some of them had it pretty rough for a long time. Mm -hmm. No, I didn't, I, I, all, I, all we faced were the Germans. Mm -hmm. And they got to be where some of them were, uh, well, the officers were all really fanatic. Okay. They, they, just, they just pushed their, the soldiers into, into our lines. Okay. That's what I understand, mm -hmm. the little we, we would hear. And, and did you kind of feel that their soldiers weren't as fanatic or were just... Our soldiers? They, uh, the, 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 the enemy soldiers. The German soldiers, I think, well, they, a lot of them got killed. Right. <laughs> you know, they just, but uh, I don't know. I, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. we, we met a few of the German soldiers after the war, during occupation, mm -hmm. and they were glad to have it over with. Mm -hmm. And they were happy that they were back home and could do their, their thing again, Get you know, get mm -hmm. to ordinary living. Yeah. Well, I remember when I, the, the night that I, my cousin picked me up to take me to the draft, you know, to, to the bus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I told my dad, I said, I don't expect to be back. And I didn't. Mm -hmm. A lot of fellas weren't, didn't come back. So, but I was very lucky and did. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how did that feel when you, before you got on the bus? You know, with the family and what do you do? You, just, you, you that there's a point where this is it. I'm drafted. I can't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. I'm going. <laughs> I'll mm -hmm. do what the, what I'm told, and I don't know where where I'm going to go. You know? yeah. I had no idea. Many and many a night, I didn't have any idea where I would be the next day. Yeah, you know. Because when we left Fort, uh, Fort Knox, we didn't know where we were going and what outfit we were going to be going in. And finally, I have some movies of me, of us in the train, found, the, found out that we were going east. Mm -hmm. And so uh, finally we went up to northern New York State in, Pine, in uh, Watertown and Pine Camp. And then we found out we were going to the Fourth Armored Division, you know, because mm -hmm. nobody, they wouldn't, there, there was no re information like that in the Second World War. Very, mm -hmm. very tight in, in the news media. Okay. Very tight. And I, you know, even for our soldiers, it didn't mean much of anything. We, we still weren't told. Mm -hmm. I'm sure the officers knew they had more of an indication than we, but. Still, we, just as a a private and a PFC, <laughs> you don't yeah, that. That's just part of life, you right. know. Yeah, yeah. Um, how? Okay. Um, what? What kinds of? Things do, do, do your does your uh, the videos that you take and what like what kinds well, of things do they show? I of course I when I got overseas they, mm -hmm. I couldn't take anything of the military. So okay, that is one thing. See, we had I think what five fellas and a warrant officer, and the warrant officer was right with us day and night. You know, they were we were all together, mm -hmm. and he said one thing: you don't take bear bomb. Is what the guns or anything like we uh, we had pictures of. Uh, I have one of the, uh, one little town at that time how they washed their clothes. They had a, there was a, a a tank in the middle of town and people would bring their clothes and they would dump it in the water and they scrub them off and that's how they washed clothes. You know I have pictures of that mm -hmm. and uh, people walking around. You know. Uh, t uh, Trying to get food, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, so they can eat, so forth. And uh, I do have some pictures of like the half tracks and uh, going down the road. And uh, I do have one picture, <coughs> <coughs> one uh, movie of us going over the um, 
pontoon bridge at Mannheim, and we there was we were in a smoke screen. It isn't very good, but it does. We can see that it's a, then we then have <coughs> part. Pardon me. We have pictures of. Uh, I have some pictures of the bridges that were knocked out and, mm -hmm. and uh, that sort of thing. Okay. And foxholes. <laughs> if mm -hmm. you would care to see it, <coughs> I'd be glad to show it to you. It's not very good, but I, you know, lend lend you a copy. <laughs> <coughs> no, excuse me. I gotta have some water. <laughs> I've been talking a lot. <laughs> I'm bringing back a lot of memories that I haven't thought of for years. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah, it, uh, it it was an experience. It's been a long, long time ago. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, any particular good memories about uh, the war time experience? Yes. Yeah. I, when I was in the desert, I got a three-day pass to to Los Angeles. Okay. No, it's more than that. And it was I got a no. It was, it was several days pass. Yeah, we got okay. weekend pass. Well, and. Can you sit, I can hear your shoes. So you're squeaking your shoes. Can you set oh. your feet flat for me? I can oh. hear your shoes. Yeah, I can hear your shoes squeaking. Sorry. Do it like that? Yeah. Okay. Um, when I was, uh, we went to, we got to L.A. And uh, there, I heard someone say that if you want to see a movie studio, why well, sign up here. <laughs> and so I signed up. And then they said, you meet at at a certain door the next morning. Well, it was 7 o'clock, and I think about 6 o'clock I was there. I was right in front of the line. Mm -hmm. And luckily, that day, they, were only take, they only took seven of us to a place called Mono, uh, Monogram Studios. Mm -hmm. And, of course, I had my movie camera, and I took, I took some pictures of them uh, when they were you know, making movies. And of course, I took it while they were doing rehearsals and so forth. Mm -hmm. And the cameraman was so wonderful. He let me set up on the camera dolly and take pictures doing that. And I've got, oh, several minutes of, uh, and the people that were there, the, the, the talent that was there at that time. And, mm -hmm. um, and it was, that was quite an experience because I, I, uh, liked movies at that time, you know, and I thought, well, gee, I, Get all the kid, and that was that's part of what's in the documentary. I had to show <laughs> some of that, you know. That's good. So yes, that was an interesting uh, day, mm -hmm. and then I got to go around L.A. and see the, the the beach and a few things like that. Okay. Yeah, that was that was a good experience, and as I said when overseas, after the war, when I got to go to uh, to the Riviera. Mm -hmm. They, the one, one town, uh, one city there along the, along the ocean, along uh, what the uh, Mediterranean. Uh, there's a, t a, a, a one of the hotels is called the Hermitage. Okay. Hermitage, but it's the Hermitage of the French, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we were treated. Like just royally. I mean, it was you know they we they would you come to the door and then they would seat you and all that stuff for all your meals. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was that was quite an experience. <laughs> and I spent a week in in uh, in the Riviera, mm -hmm. and that was at that was of course after the war and uh, the officers could be there in that town, but they you wouldn't you don't salute officers in that town. <laughs> you, you could get by, and, and so but we couldn't go to their town, <laughs> you know this oh, okay. sort of thing. And it was yeah, it was that was quite an experience there. And of course, I went to London, mm -hmm. and I got to see the uh, the, the sights of London. Mm -hmm. I just stayed in London for t actually, actually it was ten days. Mm -hmm. An experience that I had. Quite interesting. I was in London. I was walking down the street, and I looked up, and there was my first cousin. 
hmm. Jack Bez, and he was an officer. And I said, Jack! And then I backed up and I saluted. <laughs> but he, uh, he and I got together then, and he had married uh, a, a girl from London, mm -hmm. and I spent the day with him and his and his wife and the, the family, and that was quite an experience. I mean, you know, to walk through London and not even realize that you knew anyone, and mm -hmm. here was my first cousin. <laughs> it was that was something unusual. Yeah, interesting. We had some time, so I did have some good, ex uh, good experiences. Mm -hmm. All most of them were after the war, <laughs> but yeah. Now those, at least I did get to see a lot of the Europe. A lot mm -hmm. of the United States. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I was I was favorably impressed with some of the things. Uh, just mm -hmm. lucky that I got out the way it did. <laughs> yes. Um. What you talked about uh, how some of, on some of, in some of your footage you uh, got to see uh, the. Like the town life in, I guess France and Germany, and, um, and not too at least well. How they washed their clothes. Oh, okay. So we didn't see many of the, you know, it wasn't. By the time we got into the town, the people in France mm -hmm. uh, is a good example. They were gone. They they weren't going to stay there because it, the war was going through there. Mm -hmm. But after uh, after the they would you know the the Germans were pushed back. Mm -hmm. And then a few of the people would start coming back into the town. Yeah. Oh, okay. And we, yeah, we got to meet a few of them. Of course, French and I. I spoke very little French, and they spoke very little English. Mm -hmm. But we got along on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, I'd, but but they were uh, they were having very hard time because they'd had couple, uh, several years of. Uh, you know, of Germany, <laughs> mm -hmm. and taking everything from them, you mm -hmm. know. So, yeah, they, they were just trying to exist. I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. So... It was, yeah, it wasn't a standard, you know, an ordinary right. French village that you right. go into. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I see. Yeah, it, we were, <laughs> you know, we're, we're fighting through there. Right. Yeah. So you saw how they were how they were struggling. Then, yes. Kind of. Oh yeah. Yeah. We we saw a lot of that where the people were just struggling to get anything, any food, and so forth mm -hmm. to get along. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I, did you have to uh, help them out with like some aid, or things like that, or? Uh, we didn't. That, we were okay. too far, too much of the front lines. Oh, okay. You know, it wasn't. Uh, it, that wasn't. Be, wouldn't be a part of okay. our our group. We were okay. just hoping to get through there so okay. we can go to some the next town. You okay. Know. So that was more where the bulk of the population was, probably. The, yeah, they yeah. were. They they were elsewhere. Some of them were just went to the woods. Mm -hmm. they, they, you know, there's a lot of the the Vosges Mountains were a uh, low. Mountains, but there are a lot of woods there, okay. and people just went into the woods and f for a while okay. until until the, this all this passed. Did um, did you meet with? Uh, just curious if you if you met with um, some of the like French resistance against the Germans when you went through France. No, no. I didn't see any of the French resistance group uh, people in our area at all. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. They, they, they were, I think, there were more of the intelligence groups uh, in in different, you know, different areas. Okay. But and yeah, well, I didn't see them. Okay. At least we didn't know. Yeah. Maybe they, they were. We we would didn't. No one in the mountains or anything. No. No. <laughs> but the yeah, the mountains were. They, they were enough mountains, enough rolling hills that it it was it was difficult country to be you know to be. <laughs> fighting a war in, mm -hmm. and of course, then the the eastern side of it, between France and Germany, was the Maginot Line, and of course, the Siegfried Line was on the other side. Mm -hmm. But I I don't think we uh, that the Siegfried Line did us did and much uh, about holding us back. Mm -hmm. By the time we broke through the Maginot Line, uh, the the, mm -hmm. the the German army was pretty much in. 
in chaos, really, and they were running. Mm -hmm. I th and so, of course, so when they went to Heilbronn, which is, uh, what, I don't know, 30, 40 miles uh, farther east, and that was along the Necker River, and they were going to hold it at that point, and, gee, a lot of guys got it there. It was just, we didn't, we ran into, you know, the, the division and the, ran into this and not knowing that they were going to hold and it was, okay. it was pretty rough. So they were initially like defending the mountains and you yeah. had to fight and through it was, them? Yeah, and it was then... very hilly in that area okay. too. Yeah. So they had, they had uh, the higher ground on you? And you yeah, that's it. Through. And it was a lot of, lot of uh, manufacturing and a lot of places those people could hide and mm -hmm. you know, that sort of thing See, too. And it, it, was, it, was, it was rough. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, how do you feel about the war now, in retrospect, looking back on it, or how do you feel about oh. the enemy? Or oh, and, and, and the Second and, World War. Yeah, in the Second World War. Uh, well, my feeling was it, uh, it was necessary. Mm -hmm. Because what the Jap Japanese did, mm -hmm. and how that was, and how vicious that was over there, and we needed to to uh, stop it, and we need. And I I feel as a you know, and as a now, it, mm -hmm. it should have been. It should have. They should have done what they did, mm -hmm. because it has changed the whole global uh, situation. Mm -hmm. Of, of the of the Europe and Japan and China and all this is a lot of politics political change mm -hmm. now. That's true. Um, hmm. I've gone through most of my questions. Mm -hmm. um, I. Hmm. Is there anything else you can think of? No, I think I'm, you know, I just opened up today. <laughs> I've, you cover most I've of reminisced on a lot of things, I'll mm -hmm. say that. Um, you think we covered most of the ground, I think. Yeah, so, yeah, we did. And I, I'm, I hope that this will turn out to be a very interesting series, or, you know, mm -hmm. program and so forth.